Hello AP Calculus AP students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and we are going to take a look at our first video from topic 5.5. Uh, it's formally called finding the locations of absolute extrema using the candidates test but we can kind of whittle it down to just call it the candidates test so that it will help you a little bit understand the difference that it shares perhaps with the first derivative test. They're two very similar things, but they accomplish a couple of different tasks. So let's dive right in here. And we see from the notes here from Avon High School, I start off with this pretty uh, vibrant green box that outlines the guidelines for finding absolute extrema. Now let's understand the difference, absolute extrema versus relative extrema. Back before you all were dealing with finding the extrema on a graph, that was typically unbounded at the ends. Maybe they had arrows and went from negative infinity to infinity, at which point you could only find relative extrema. You could only find the locations of these hilltops and valleys that were the overall relative high points and low points, but not the the uh, global, let's say, high points and endpoints, not the Mount Everests, not the Marianas Trenches of the world. Now, what you could do today with this video is that we will define a function, let's say, on a closed interval, like such, and now you're going to be able to find the overall highest point and the overall lowest point. And that's what we call the absolute extrema, sometimes referred to as global extrema. So you're going to notice the process starts very similarly. You're going to find the critical numbers of f in the open interval that you're provided. Now that does mean you take the derivative and then you set that derivative equal to zero or potentially find where that derivative is undefined. Then this is where things start to change. You do not set up a number line. You're going to instead evaluate the original function at every single critical point that you found from step one. And then part three, the part that's easy to forget, you need to evaluate the function at each of the endpoints. These two parts are what we refer to as the candidates test. And I think you can see from my second picture that I drew up here that an absolute extrema could possibly occur at an endpoint. That's why we have to check them. And then basically, the smallest of those values that you found in parts two and three would be the absolute minimum. The greatest one would be the absolute maximum. And it's worth noting that those maximum or minimum values are the y's, the f of x values. That's what I want to see. That's what the AP exam wants you to give. It is not the x at which they occur, but it's actually the y value. Let's go ahead and take a look at our first example, 1a. Um, I'm going to break example 1a, b, and c into three separate videos. And let's... Uh, Take a look here. Find the absolute extrema of this function f of x equal 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed on the closed interval negative 1, 2. It says that you can use your calculator to sketch the graph and verify. It turns out I've already done that at the end of the video, so we'll take a look at that when we're finished. So first part, not any mystery here, you're going to take the derivative. So the derivative of this polynomial function, pretty easy to deal with. We get 12x cubed minus 12x squared. Our next step is going to be to find the critical values. So you're going to have to set this derivative equal to 0. And I don't ever like to shun the other possibility, even though I can tell that it's not going to be pertinent here. But we also want to deal with where does this derivative become undefined? Because it is possible that you could have these sharp points that occur at these absolute maximum positions. And so therefore, we need to consider them. But as I said, since f prime is not a fraction, it's probably not going to have any undefined values. Over here, for the f prime being 0, I'm going to go ahead and factor out 12x squared to kind of get the ball rolling. This is the one portion of the, of the unit that does require a little bit of common uh, knowledge of algebra. This algebra that I'm doing is Algebra 1, which you've most likely taken um, in middle school. So we're going to go ahead and set these equal to 0. And I end up with what looks like to be two critical values. I want to just double check, are both of them on the interval negative 1 to 2? They both are. So we're going to go ahead and use 
the two of them. Now, this is where we take the detour. Do not make a number line. Not when you're asked to find absolute extrema and you're given an interval. That should be your clue to go with something a little bit of a different approach. And that approach is more of a table of values. You could say a t-chart. You can set it up vertically or horizontally. It doesn't matter really. We have values of x and we have values of f of x. I wrote my f of x column a little wider because I might be doing some work there. And then all we do is we just take our candidates, right? Who wants to run for this illicit position, this wonderful position of being maximum or minimum? Well, we have four candidates. And it doesn't matter which order you place them into your table. If you want to place them in numerical order, negative one would be the first one, followed by zero, followed by a positive one, followed by two. Notice I use both the endpoints in addition to the two critical values. The next thing you do is just plug them into the original function, not the derivative, the original function. That's an f of x. So what do I get? Well, if I plug in negative 1 in for my x, I get 3 times negative 1 to the fourth minus 4 times negative 1 cubed. Now you will have to evaluate these. You need to know what is their numerical equivalence. So we have 3 times negative 1 to the fourth is positive 3. Minus 4 times negative 1 to the third is going to be a minus well, a negative 4 times a negative 1, which is actually going to be a positive when all is said and done. And so right now I get 7. 7 is the only number I have to compare. Right now it's my maximum and my minimum, I guess. Next we'll plug in 0. 0 is going to be by far and away the easiest number to plug in. Maybe you don't even have to write that step out, and it's perfectly fine. All of this preliminary work, if you can do in your head, that is completely okay. We do need to see the values in the table. Plugging in 1 might be the second easiest value to work with here. And it looks like we're going to have a negative 1 out of that when all is said and done. So we now have a, a new candidate, a new possibility for our minimum. Let's see what 2 gives us, and this will finish it up. 3 times 2 to the 4th minus 4 times 2 to the 3rd. This would be 3 times 16, that's 48, minus 4 times 8, that's a 32. So this is going to give us a 16, which I think is going to now serve as our maximum. And so right now, we're going to go ahead and state our answers. The absolute min is negative 1. Notice I'm using the y value. And then I will state the absolute max, and that would be positive 16 in this case. And you don't have to state where they occur, and the reason is that you really already have that information in the table. But it's extremely important that the, those y's are extracted from the table. On AP exams that I have scored, if a student wrote the word max next to the 16, there are times that we have taken it and we're okay with that. I, I don't advocate it because if you put that word max just somewhere that's not where it should be, you could really run the risk of not earning the point. And that's why I like to write this um, up right over here. So our min is at negative one. Our min is negative one. Our max is 16. If I fast forward past the next couple examples I'm going to do onto this page, you can see I have sketched this wonderful graph between negative one and two. And lo and behold, our maximum is indeed at 16, and our minimum might be a little hard to tell because of the scale here. That's a negative 1 value, and that's a, uh, where that min occurs. I strongly encourage you to practice this technique. Um, it's such an important part of the AP exam. There is a 100% guarantee that you're going to see this. It very likely could appear both in the free response and the multiple choice. I'm going to take a look at parts B and C next. Uh, if you want to jot this part B down, you certainly could do that. Work on that a little bit and then uh, uh, go to my video where you uh, can see the solution to example one, part B. Anyway, hope this helps. We'll see you next time.